arms resplendent from the gallow tree. And what he brings in his hurt hands, it's life on life for you and me. Joy, joy, joy to the heart, and all in his good day's dawning. Joy, joy, joy to the heart, and all in his good day's dawning. Look, Jesus Christ, inside his plane, look down both up the stony stone, and let the blood flow from his flesh. To fill the springs of living hope Joy, joy, joy to the heart And all in his good taste dawning Joy, joy, joy to the heart And all in his good taste dawning Good Jesus Christ, our brother died And darkness tucked upon the tree Inside the Trinity, joy, joy, joy to the heart, and all in His good is dawning. Joy, joy, joy to the heart, and all in His good is dawning. Look there, the Christ, our brother, comes, resplendent from the gallows tree. Life on life for you and me. Joy, joy, joy to the heart, and all in his good is done. Joy, joy, joy to the heart, and all in his good is done. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you to Michael and Nancy and Kirsten for that piece. Wonderful to gather together on this second Sunday of Easter. I hope that you've had a wonderful first Easter week. And uh, we head into this next week, starting with the solar eclipse tomorrow. What's going to happen? Should be a glorious day tomorrow. The kids are excited to have school off. If you're in one school district, and apologies to those in the other one. But it's going to be a wonderful event, a wonderful day, a wonderful day nonetheless. Uh, we do welcome you to this second Resurrection Sunday, and you will see in your bulletins our sermon series that we will be undertaking together in these coming weeks. Uh, during our Lent season, we worked our way through John chapter 19, and now during this Resurrection season, we will be working through the Gospel of John chapter 20 and looking at the appearances of the living, risen Jesus Christ to the disciples long ago. And with each week, we will be adding a unique art piece in our Schumann Hall area. So on the platform stage area, you will see one art piece being added each week associated with each uh, week of our sermon series. So please do enjoy those as you head over there in a little while for the brunch together. Today, we have two calls in the bulletin that you will notice. First of all, it's a call from our Board of Missions for anyone interested in a summer missions project together. You'll see the information listed there. There's a meeting after our second service, and so please do take note of that call. And secondly, we have a call for choir participation. If you would like to try choir out, this is a great time to do that in these coming weeks before summer, and so take note of that announcement as well. As we look to next week, yes, a cheer from the choir loft on that one. Thank you. Uh, as we look to next week to our... Um, April 14th and 21st, you will notice in the bulletin that we have uh, two emphasis weeks from our Board of Christian Education. We will be celebrating our Sunday school program and all the offerings that we have available also throughout the week for Christian education opportunities, all the way from our infants and kids um, up into uh, the later years of life. And so we will be celebrating our Board of Education emphasis these next two weeks. Stay tuned for uh, that to unfold for us all. And then also, and finally, this morning, you may be looking through the bulletin saying, where is the Mary Poppins play performance announcement? And we are so happy to tell you that if you would like that announcement, please go buy the local newspaper. 
because there is a feature article uh, in, in the newspaper uh, highlighting that coming performance. We're so grateful to Ms. Kirsten Boyd and to all of the volunteers and helpers for our Call Street players, and we're very excited for this second drama performance. You can buy tickets online. Go to the First Protestant Church website, and you will find the link there. And then finally, as we look further forward to the summer months, you will notice various camp opportunities that are announced in the bulletin, we have our joint collaborative Evangelical Association children's and teen camps. We also have the summer drama camps that will be on offer here at the church campus. So please do spread the word about these different experiences. And finally, this morning, you will notice some very, very lovely flowers on the altar. This is in celebration of the 50th. Yes, you heard that correctly. The 50th wedding anniversary of Russell and Karen Lackey. And uh, congratulations to the lackeys on this special anniversary. We do celebrate with you and God's faithfulness to your family. I invite you now to take your bulletin in hand and we will open our service with our spoken call to worship. And then we will take our hymnals, stand together and sing our opening hymn, hymn number 299. Let us dedicate this service to the Lord Jesus Christ together with this spoken call to worship. On that first Easter morn, the disciples asked, where have they laid the body of our Lord? They searched until Jesus found Mary and said, why are you weeping? What do you seek? So visit us this morning, O risen one. May your word tug us to your body and blood. Amen. Let's stand together and worship. It is still Easter for us. The Easter is a season, not a day. And so turn to someone next to you and say, Happy Easter. It's still Easter. Let's greet one another.
Please be seated. Let's take a moment to quiet our thoughts as we come to a time of prayer. Gracious Lord, you gather us today in your house to hear your word, praise you in song, lift up our prayers, and receive the sacrament your son established for us before he was taken to the cross. May his body and blood nourish us spiritually and increase our desire for eternal life in the new heavens and the new earth. We pray this morning for First Protestant Church, that we who worship here may continue to receive your mercy and guidance in our lives, and that those who faithfully serve this church will have their faith strengthened daily and their hard work rewarded by a dynamic ministry in the heart of this city. We pray for healing for those suffering from sickness or injury especially those within our first Protestant family. And we ask your special blessing on those living with mental illness or severe depression. Comfort them with the reassurance that can only come from the one who created and governs the universe, yet cares for each of us uniquely and individually. We don't always understand why illness and despair come into our lives, but we do know that you walk every path of life with us, and we need never be without hope. We humbly pray this morning for those who govern us in civic life, those who supervise us at work, and those who serve us in a thousand unseen ways. Sustain them in their work. Give them wisdom and compassion so that we may live in an orderly and prosperous community. We pray also for our fellow citizens who get up every day and put on the uniform of the military or of a first responder. As they put themselves between us and danger, let us honor their sacrifice and that of their families with our gratitude and prayers. And we pray for those in our communities and even in our midst who struggle to make ends meet. Those without a job, maybe without a home, without the resources that we take for granted. And especially to those families with young children, make us not only aware of their needs, but responsive in any way we can. We pray for the men and women who teach our youth in schools, churches, clubs, and mentoring programs, and especially in the First Protestant School. Give them the patience and perseverance they need to inspire their students, to recognize a special gift or address a special need with compassion and love, and bless the students with a desire to learn, helping them to understand that integrity and humility are as much a part of their education as science or grammar. Heavenly Father, we lift these prayers to you this morning, knowing that you hear us when we pray in the name of your Son, our risen Lord, Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Good morning. Our scripture lesson is from John 20, 11 through 18. 
Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, the other at the foot. They ask her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this time, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord, she said to tell them, and he had said these things to her. Blessed be the word of our God. Amen. Well, I invite you to open your copy of Holy Scripture with me. If you have one of the Red Pew Bibles, we are on page 768, John chapter 20, beginning in verse 11. And as we turn there, please join me in a word of prayer, asking for the illumination of the Holy Spirit in this moment together. God, our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you do speak to us, that your word is living and active 
And we pray now that the meditations of all of our hearts and the words of my mouth would be pleasing in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, we are in the second week of Easter, and we are looking at our second resurrection appearance. In a way, this is actually the first appearance where Jesus Christ shows himself in his physical body, his resurrected physical body for the first time after the crucifixion. And we will be looking at a number of these resurrection scenes and kind of excavating them, looking into them a bit more deeply perhaps than we typically do, asking what does the resurrection mean for us in our daily lives as followers of Jesus Christ? Because resurrection is not just a fact long ago, it's a reality that can be known and encountered right now. The book of Acts, at the very beginning, chapter 1, verse 3, kind of summarizes these resurrection appearances, and I'm going to uh, utilize the King James Version on this verse as I read it to you now, because it's just so gloriously said, it can't be improved upon. The King James has Acts, chapter 1, verse 3, in this way. It says, to the disciples, Jesus presented himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. Hear that again. To the disciples, Jesus presented himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. I, I love that phrase, many infallible proofs. That, that phrase captured the imaginations of many Christians and theologians and pastors over the years. In 1886, there was a pastor in Philadelphia by the name of A.T. Pearson, and he published a very well-known book called Many Infallible Proofs. And, and in that book, Pearson says, the proofs that Holy Scripture gives us of the resurrection, of God's existence, of the love and grace that can come to us through the Holy Spirit, that it's not like scientific proofs. What we're looking at is proofs for anyone who brings what he calls honest doubt and questioning to the Holy Scriptures. It's, it's not knock out logical arguments that Scripture gives us, but it's helps along the way for honest, earnest seekers of God. Samuel Butler was an author just a few years after 1886, Many Infallible Proofs book, and, and Butler um, wrote his own book in, in this vein. And Butler provides for us what I, what I call the Napoleon Bonaparte test when he describes the kinds of proofs that Scripture gives to us. It goes like this. Butler said, if you hold such a high standard of proof for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that when that same standard is applied to other historical figures, such as the existence of Napoleon Bonaparte, if your standard is so high that it disproves the existence of these other figures, then you're asking more than historical data can give you. Pearson and Butler are really making the same point, that when Scripture gives us these resurrection appearances, what we are not given is kind of sealed in uh, logical, historical data in a sense that would convince anyone and everyone. These are not knockout proofs. These are infallible proofs. That means they're unfailing for those whose hearts need the assurance of the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, the author Annie Dillard will be a name that's familiar to many of you, and, and she gives a wonderful analogy of the kinds of proofs that Scripture gives us in these resurrection appearances. She tells us that when she was about six years old, she developed a game in her neighborhood. She would take those large um, pieces of sidewalk chalk, do you know these? And uh, they, they don't dissipate in the rain, magically. I don't know. These things exist forever and ever somehow. But she would take these uh, sidewalk chalk pieces and draw huge arrows in the middle of the road. And she would lead people over to a space where there were all of these arrows converging on one little spot where she would lay a penny. And she would write, uh, as this game developed over, over the months and years, she would write notes like, surprise over here, or my favorite one, she would say, this way for free cash. And she tells us that she would relish in the joy of watching adults come 
to those converging arrows, and they would smile as they picked up a penny of change and put it in their pocket. Annie Dillard is telling us that these resurrection appearances are more like that sidewalk chalk arrow than they are the proof of a scientist telling us that this is so or that is so. God is giving us hints to more joy, to a fuller life with the risen Jesus Christ. But searching and seeking is required. That's what we find in each of these resurrection appearances. In our text this morning, we find a disciple set forth as a model for all of us. Uh, twice in this text, verse 13 in the mouth of the angels, and verse 15 in the mouth of Jesus Christ, she is simply called woman. And to our ears in modern English, this sounds like a very odd way to refer to someone, but in John's ancient way of referring to people, this is actually a term of dignity. Jesus had referred to his mother in John chapter 2 at the wedding of Cana in the same way. He says, woman, what are you asking me to do? And then she asks for the miracle. So what John is saying is that Mary Magdalene here is a paradigmatic human example, a model disciple. And this is amazing because of all the disciples that Jesus could have chosen to be his first preacher, to be his first messenger, his, his chief of staff, as uh, the good news is spread to the disciples and then to the whole world, it's so surprising to us that he chooses Mary Magdalene. As you think of it, you, you will notice uh, our resurrection window over here, to my left and to your right, the second from the front, where Jesus is standing in front of the empty tomb. And we may ask ourselves, where, are, uh, where is Mary Magdalene in this window? Because many of the other scenes include other characters around Jesus Christ. That is our John chapter 20, 11 to 18 window right there. And the answer is that you and I are Mary Magdalene. That window is getting this text exactly right, that Mary is the paradigmatic disciple encountering the resurrected Jesus Christ, sent out with this news to share with the whole world and to take that joy into our hearts this morning. We are put in the place of Mary Magdalene. What a text this is. The, the New Testament scholar Dale Allison tells us, unlike the 12 disciples in John's gospel, Mary is never associated with doubt. She's associated with seeking and searching, but never with doubt. And so this first appearance is a positive story. She doesn't have doubt, but as we open this text, she, she does begin with confusion. Now, confusion is a feature that marked uh, much of Mary Magdalene's life. Actually, her past was marked by confusion. In the Gospel of Luke chapter 8, we learn that Mary Magdalene was someone who was possessed by seven demons. Now, we don't know what that means exactly, but it means that there was a lot of noise and clatter and confusion in her life before she met Jesus Christ. The tradition of Christian history tells us that Mary Magdalene had a disreputable uh, reputation around her community. She was known as a prostitute and as someone who did not have an upstanding, noble birth or adult life. But Jesus Christ had come into Mary Magdalene's life. He had cast out the demons. And what Mary loved the most about Jesus, we see this in verse 16 when she calls him a very specific term, Rabboni, uh, rabbi, teacher. What Mary seems to love most about Jesus is that he did show her that clear path. She loved the instruction and teaching aspect of Christ's ministry. Some of you here this morning are like that. You're always yearning for the teaching of the Lord and eager to sit at the feet as his word is opened up. That was Mary as well. But now the passion has happened. Jesus has been buried and her teacher is gone. And her spirit once again is brought back to a place of deep, profound confusion. In verse 13, the, the words that come out of her mouth are words of confusion. She says, I have not known where they set him. Just even the, the structure of the grammar of that sentence in the ancient Greek is, is almost too confusing to capture. She, she's saying, I, I didn't know where they put him and now I don't know and I just don't know what I'm doing here and where I'm supposed to go now. 
She, she places herself and presents herself as a confused person. There's a swirl of noise around her and she can't orient herself. She, she confuses the angels for something. She's not even surprised to see these glorious angels. That shows confusion. In verse 15, she confuses Jesus for the gardener. Just everything is flipped upside down in Mary's heart and mind. And, and some of you know that feeling. When you have a devastating event happen in your life, it's like this great chasm opens up and you don't know how to go forward. You just sit and stare at this grand canyon, this hole in your life, and everything is confusing in that moment. But Mary had a tenacity to her faith. We saw this last week, unlike the disciples John and Peter who just locked themselves up in their house, Mary had moved out into the darkness and she had gone to the tomb. Now John and Peter have gone back to their home, but Mary lingers. And twice in this text, we're told that Mary sees something. In, in verse 12, she sees the angels. In verse 14, she sees this gardener. And the word for see that is used here is, is not just glanced at. You'll hear the Greek word, it's theoria. It's where we get our word theorizing. What the text is telling us is that Mary is there deeply pondering what is around her. She's trying to get her orientation points. She's trying to understand what is real. Now, this is more than a glance, it's a lot more. It means that she is theorizing. She's really seeking to understand what is unfolding around her. And as Mary lingers, as she theorizes and ponders, where is Jesus? God begins to lay out those chalk marks, those clues for her. She can find her teacher again if she follows the hints that Jesus lays out for her. Notice, first of all, at the beginning of this chapter, the stone is rolled away. That was her first hint. She followed it very well. She went and found John and Peter. And as she continues to linger, it's, it's symbolized by her standing in verse 12. She's not sitting in despair. She's standing. She's attentive. God gives her another sidewalk chalk arrow. She sees two angels. Now, now think about it. Why were there two angels? If, if you canvass all of the Apostle John's writings from the Gospel of John to the Epistles of John to the book of Revelation, you'll read about John talking of uh, thousands of ten thousands of angels. That's one category of angels for him. You'll read about 24 angels. You'll read about a category of seven angels. And you'll read about a category of four angels, the most glorious and powerful angels that overlook and oversee the functioning of of heaven and earth, but here there's only two. This is the only time John mentions two angels. Why? Well, because God is making up to her that John and Peter, the appointed apostles, the appointed leaders of the faith, have fled the scene. God is making up to her as she lingers and waits for the Lord, and he provides an even better double messenger to Mary. What about you and I? Do we linger like Mary lingers here? Try, try this question for yourself. Do I believe in God's timing so much that I let God solve the spiritual problems in the lives of those that I care about the most? Or do I insist on solving their spiritual problems in my own timing, through my own strength? I was in a group recently and a dad, a young father, shared um, about uh, his, his young son who had developed a kind of nervous tick. And it got very, very bad and very distracting in his classroom, to his siblings, and uh, mostly to his parents. And, and so they scheduled some professional counseling. The whole family went. And the counselor listened to their situation. They did their assessment. And then the counselor turned to the father and said, Step one of this whole process is for you to forgive your son of this tick, to accept him entirely as he is right now. Only then will this nervous tick begin to go away in its own timing. 
and your love will provide the context. There's a power to lingering and letting God unfold his healing in his own timing. You know, if you have read much scripture or if you have walked with God for any length of time, you will know that God is notoriously late. You've experienced this. This is the way it always happens. But you'll also know that it's always worth the wait, that God's timing is better than our timing, that his solutions are better than our solutions. And sometimes we see a problem, we we feel confused, and we just want to fix the problem. That's what Mary will do in a moment. She wants to cling to Jesus, and she wants to set him down and control him so that she knows what timing will come. And Jesus says, it just doesn't work like that. Faith involves lingering and waiting. It involves sitting in the confusion and waiting for God's solutions, not our solutions. God's timing, not our timing. And God makes it worth it for Mary. All of this lingering, all of this waiting. Because finally, Jesus does come on the scene. He moves up behind her. She turns around and she thinks that it's the gardener. Jesus disguises himself. Or does he? Does Jesus deceive people? Does he put on a false mask? I don't think that God does deceive anyone. Could it be the case that Mary, her assessment, her theorizing is actually correct? That Jesus has come back as the gardener. He's come back as the one that will walk through the garden with Adam and Eve each and every day. Or maybe he's like the new Adam who's going to replant the garden of Eden around Mary and around every follower who waits for him to do so. That's the grace that we're still waiting for today, for God to develop that garden, that beauty and that grace all around us in his perfect timing. A lingering faith looks and waits again and again until it finally finds Jesus Christ in the midst of our confusion. And finally, it's the moment of revelation Jesus is going to take the mask off. He's going to do it by speaking Mary's name. Now think with me for a minute. If Hollywood were to script this scene, this first appearance of Jesus Christ, how would it go? I I imagine that the camera would begin in the tomb while Jesus is still lying down. His body would start to glow, the green glow like the Hulk maybe or something like that. He would start to glow. The lights would be coming on. Jesus would then stand up and Superman like he would rip off The garments that had been placed around him, the hat would be yanked off, hair would come out. He would extend his hand and the stone in front of the tomb would be obliterated and it would shatter. The shrapnel would go towards his enemies, not his followers. They would fall down on the ground and say, okay, okay, okay. And the followers would say, we win. Victory, take Jerusalem, we win, right? This would be the Hollywood version of the first appearance of the resurrection, but... How opposite is this? Remember what A.T. Pearson and Samuel Butler said. They said, those are just not the kinds of infallible proofs that God has chosen to give us. Why not? Because that is not God's kind of power. God doesn't show up to vanquish enemies. God doesn't come to demean and to humiliate. God comes with a healing power, with an empowerment for those who are in the midst of their confusion. So how does Jesus do this right now in Mary's confusion? Remember, Mary loved Jesus as her teacher. That's what was most special to her. And so as Jesus calls her name and that look of recognition happens, Jesus then speaks to her in verses 16, 17, and 18 of our passage. And what Jesus says to her harkens back to two teachings that he had given her before. Think with me, all the way back to chapter one of John's gospel, Jesus had been speaking to one of his early followers, and and as that follower believed in him, Jesus said, mark my words, all of those who follow me will see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Ascending, descending on the Son of Man. Mary would have heard that teaching, but she never would have known that she would be the first one to experience it. They're the angels. They've descended on the place where Jesus was. Soon they will ascend again. 
The teaching of Jesus links Mary's heart back to her Lord. There's a second link here, all the way back three days before in chapter 16, in what's known as the upper room discourse, Jesus had said to all of the disciples, Mary would have heard this teaching. Listen to these words, chapter 16, verse 19 to 22. Jesus said that they wanted to, uh, excuse me, um, Jesus said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said in a little while you will not see me anymore? And then after a little while, you will see me. I tell you the truth, my disciples, you will weep and mourn even as the world is rejoicing. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. Listen to this text, verse 21. Jesus said on the night in which he would be betrayed, a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into this world. So it is with you, Jesus says. Now is your time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice. And Mary thinks back to that teaching and she thinks, I'm that woman. I'm the one who was in labor. I was selected to be the very first to give birth to the Easter resurrection message. You see what God is doing, what Jesus is doing in the midst of Mary's confusion is he's stitching back together her previous experiences of God with her present experience of God. Do you see that? Jesus is, is, I imagine it like he's creating a rope bridge across this chasm in her heart and in her life. And he's asking her to step out and to walk across that wobbly but very secure structure towards the risen Lord. It's an amazing story. And it's amazing that God does this in our lives. Actually, historians have been amazed at this text. More than any other of the resurrection appearances, historians have found that there's a ring of authenticity, his historicity to this reporting. There's a famous Dutch historian, New Testament scholar by the name of Joaquin Jeremias. And he says the ring of authenticity comes through in two ways for us in this text. First of all, if this story were a fabrication, the author would not have chosen a woman, Jeremias says, as the first visionary. Because women were not considered legally qualified in that culture to be a public witness. So the gospel would have never written it like this if it were not so. And secondly, Jeremiah says, as she shares the message in the story with the disciples, the disciples don't believe her. And this adds to the authenticity, Jeremiah says, because it paints the disciples who were the authors of these texts in a bad light. And if it were not true, they wouldn't have said it that way. So there's a profound ring of authenticity to what happens in Mary's life at this moment, the, the sidewalk chalk marks are very, very clear. And this morning, God is doing the same thing in our hearts, in our lives, by his resurrection power that he did in Mary's life. He's stitching together those past experiences of him in our lives to this present moment. And anyone who lingers, who seeks after the power of the resurrection, will find some hint, some experience of this power today. There's a leader, um, as we draw to a close here and prepare for communion, I want to tell you about a leader by the name of Michael O. O-H is his last name. And he is the CEO of what's called the Lausanne Movement, which is an initiative that was founded in 1974 by Billy Graham and uh, John Stott. And in September 2024, uh, the Lausanne Movement is holding its fourth international congress and it will be held in Seoul, South Korea. First Protestant Church will actually be one of the satellite hosts for this historic event that will be uh, hosted all over the world. Millions and millions of churches, missions organizations will share in this conference together. And, and one, man, one man shared this story about the upcoming meeting. This is Michael O. Oh. He said, during a devastating conflict in Seoul, South Korea in 1945, there was a nine-year-old boy and that nine-year-old boy um, was helped in, in a particular way by an American soldier. That soldier, after helping this boy and his family, he, he placed a peanut in the boy's hand. And the little boy said back to him the only two words in English that he knew, thank you and goodbye. 
And that young boy would soon become a Christian in a nation in South Korea where at that time there was only something like 20,000 Christians in, in that large country. And as he grew as a Christian, he would be called to become a missionary. He would become a missionary to the northern neighbors to the nation of Japan to go and to share the gospel, to serve the people in the name of Jesus Christ. And now, 80 years later, that boy that turned missionary has a son, Michael O, the CEO of the Lausanne movement. And as Michael O was selecting a city for this international Congress, God laid it on his heart as one raised in Japan, but with an ethnic Korean background, how beautiful would it be to bring these two nations of Japan and Korea together for this historic convocation of missions, two nations that have battled one another throughout history. And Michael O said, it was like God was stitching together the story of my life, the story of two nations, and who knows what God will do through this meeting that will take place in September. That's what the resurrection is all about. That's what our resurrection window is all about, that in our, in our confusing moments, God comes into our lives to reaffirm what he has done in the past, to stitch a rope bridge up, across those chasms that take place in your life until you and I arrive in that final place where Eden wraps around us once again. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we prepare to receive our tithes and offerings and give thanks for this power. And then we will approach the communion table together. God, our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its depth. We thank you that it is trustworthy, that these resurrection appearances, they do, they, they write these sidewalk chalk arrows for us, that as we seek and we yearn for your power in our confusing moments, you give us hints, you call us to linger and to wait, and you reward that waiting with words from you, with experiences of power. Receive now these tithes and offerings in the gratitude of our hearts and to the praise of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior. Amen.
join me in prayer as we dedicate these tithes and offerings to the Lord's service. God, our Father, we thank you for your tremendous generosity to each and every one of us and to this congregation. We pray that you would use these gifts to spread the good news and experiences of the resurrection throughout this world. Especially, we pray for those this morning who are in times of confusion. Stitch their lives together by reminders of your grace and experiences of your power. We pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, let's remain standing, and as we do prepare to approach the Lord's table, let us take upon our lips and confess together the faith that we confess with all Christians around the world in the Apostles' Creed, saying, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy universal Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body, and the life of everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. And now we do approach the Lord's table. It's, it's called the Lord's table because this is his bread. This is his cup. This is his sacrifice that is on offer to each and every one who, as Jesus says, everyone is invited who hungers and thirsts for righteousness. We're invited this morning to come to the Lord's table in a spirit of humility and of repentance with an awareness of how we fall short, and yet of how God so richly supplies all of our needs with his grace and his forgiveness. And so hear these words from Jesus Christ. All has been made ready. Come, I desire to share this meal with you. It was on the night that Jesus was betrayed that he gathered the disciples in the upper room, and after they had eaten, he took the bread and he blessed it. And he broke it, and he said, this is my body that is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after they had eaten the bread, he took the cup, and he blessed it. And he said, this is the new covenant of my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Please join me in prayer, a prayer of blessing for these elements and for each of us as we do partake of the Lord's Supper together. God, our Father, we thank you for your tremendous generosity You've not only given us wonderful gifts in nature and in our daily experiences in this life, but you have given us what is most precious in the whole universe, your son. Jesus Christ, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for the body that you offered in our place, for the blood that you shed to cleanse and forgive us and make us right with God again. And Holy Spirit, we now pray that you would come into our hearts. You would enable us to receive this meal in faith, that truly we would know that we are partaking in the body and blood of our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please do hold on to your wafer as it is served, and we will partake together once everyone has been served. If you need a gluten-free wafer, that is available up front, and it is self-serve.
This is the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given for you. Take and eat for the nourishment of your souls. As the cup is now passed, please note that the clear cups are grape juice and the red is wine. Please do hold on to your cup and we will partake together once everyone has been served. This is the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which forges a new covenant of forgiveness. Take and drink for the nourishment of your souls. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we declare the Lord's death until he returns. And scripture tells us for everyone who has confessed their sins, God is faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. Amen. Well, let us say now the prayer that Jesus taught us to say, saying together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand together, and for our last hymn, you will find it printed in your bulletin. This is our Easter hymn, Lift High the Cross. Let us sing together.
Amen. Wonderful to worship together on this second Sunday of Easter. Please do join us in Schumann Hall, just out the back doors to the left for our coffee brunch fellowship time. It would be lovely to greet you there. And uh, please know that the resurrection power of Jesus is present with you in this coming week. Let us all share that good news to all whom we know and all who we will encounter in this coming week. Receive now this blessing as we are dismissed. Der Herr behüte deinen Ausgang und Eingang von nun an bis in Ewigkeit. May the Lord oversee your comings and your goings from this time forth and forevermore. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.